commercial real estate markets have come under a tremendous amount of pressure this year, hit by the historically rapid rise in interest rates alongside massive changes in tenant behavior, most notably the shift to hybrid and remote work. What does all of this mean for investors? And is it possible that today's crisis may be sowing the seeds of tomorrow's opportunity? I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's very, very tough out there. And things, at least from a valuation perspective, are going to get worse before they get better. But with the right time horizon and risk tolerance, uh, I think there's some very, very interesting opportunities in both real estate equity and debt. That was Joe Gorin, head of U.S. real estate equity at Barings. And this is Streaming Income, a podcast from Barings. I'm your host, Greg Campion. Coming up on the show, the outlook for U.S. real estate equity and why the real estate equity portfolios of tomorrow might look substantially different from those of today. All right, Joe Gorin, welcome to Streaming Income. It's great to be here. I'm psyched to have you. Uh, I'm psyched to talk about commercial real estate. It's a segment of the market that is just really in focus at the moment. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody wants to talk about it. Clearly, quite a few headwinds. You've got structural headwinds. You've got cyclical headwinds. I don't think we're breaking any news uh, by, by talking about that. But what I'd like to get a sense from you, maybe right up front, is are things as dire as the average media headline would lead you to believe today? Well, if folks are uh, going to listen into this podcast and think that I'm going to go glass half full, yeah, uh, I think we all have to be pretty sober about the environment for real estate investing right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Some of the headlines are right. Some are overblown. But you know, you really, as you said, cyclical and structural, you really have to dig into those two questions. The biggest cyclical issue we have in real estate right now, which... I could argue is a structural issue down the road is interest rates. Mm-hmm. Real estate is a highly uh, interest rate sensitive asset class. And we've got, in my investing career, one of the most challenging interest rate moves, you know, over uh, of many cycles. And so, you know, what that means is there's a massive value question. Mm. What is equity worth today? No one pro forma the 10 year going from two and a half to three and a half to 5%, right. that wasn't in anybody's playbook. Yep. So now we're trying to manage the valuation question. There's not all negative out there. There's there's the structural issues. Some are negative, some are positive. Let's hit the first negative one, okay. office. Of course. That's a structural issue. Mm-hmm. This is I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, but that's something that we're going to have to navigate because we're not going to ever go back to the way people used to use office. You know, as an example, our office utilization number is 60% of what it was pre pandemic. Hmm. By now, people thought we'd be getting back into the office. Hmm. We're probably never going to use office buildings the way we used to. That's a major structural issue that we're going to have to work with. And we've got the interest rate problem for the value. So, other structural issues that we have that are positive Mm -hmm. look at the residential sector. You've got some great tailwinds for apartments and rental real estate. The bad news is home affordability is so difficult today. But those structural issues are having a positive impact on what we can invest in from a real estate perspective. Yeah, okay. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, I also want to give a little context to people, a little historical context. If you think about how real estate equity portfolios have traditionally been constructed, uh, what I'd like to do is understand where we've kind of been where we're at now, and then kind of where we're going, right? Mm-hmm. Because a number of the trends that you mentioned, especially the structural trends, I would imagine are going to change the way institutional investors and others want to actually construct their real estate equity allocations over time. So I think it'd be great to walk through that and leave people actually at the end of this conversation with some real ideas there in terms of you know where they may want to go with their real estate equity allocations but maybe to start where are we coming from what does that traditional mix look like if you uh, you know you mentioned some of the sectors what does that traditional mix look like in your traditional real estate equity portfolio yeah well let's go back to you know the early 2000s I mean even before that you know if you look at the construct of institutional ownership in real estate it was pretty basic for a long time 80s 90s 2000s if you look at the NACREF index, which is basically the major index that tracks institutional ownership in real estate, it was kind of broken up across the categories of office, resi, retail, and industrial. Office 
was by far the highest holding of institutional investors. Mm. And surprisingly, it was the highest holding basically up until the start of the pandemic. Then you look at the other categories, apartments and retail were a little bit lower in the range of 15 to 20%. So if office was 35 to 40%, then you've got the lowest, which people today are probably going to be surprised to hear for a very long time, 20 plus years, industrial was the lowest holding. Today, you've had a flip and it didn't start today. It started really back in 2015, 2017. I would argue that a lot of the shift in institutional ownership in real estate has been driven by technology, innovation, convergences of technology. And that's really sprouted, obviously, the industrial category. It's hurt the, hurt the retail category. Mm-hmm. When you look at the makeup of institutional ownership today, you've got office, which is trending down below, it's right around 25%. It was as high as 35 to 40%. And now you've got apartments that's moving into the 30 plus category. You've got industrial that's very close to the apartment ownership and retail's a bit of a laggard, but that's been pretty steady. So today is a, a very different outcome in terms of institutional ownership. But a lot of people may think today has been going on for a long time. Mm. It hasn't. Mm. And it's really interesting to see this shift. And I would argue that this is going to be a shift that goes forward. We don't think office is coming back mm. the way it, it used to and in, within institutional ownership, but it's a, it's a much different paradigm. On top of that, You've also had a number of subcategories within each of these four categories that have gotten really interesting. You've got data centers. Commercial real estate markets have come under a tremendous amount of pressure this year, hit by the historically rapid rise in interest rates alongside massive changes in tenant behavior, most notably the shift to hybrid and remote work. What does all of this mean for investors? And is it possible that today's crisis may be sowing the seeds of tomorrow's opportunity. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's very, very tough out there. And things, at least from a valuation perspective, are going to get worse before they get better. But with the right time horizon and risk tolerance, uh, I think there's some very, very interesting opportunities in both real estate equity and debt. That was Joe Gorin, head of U.S. real estate equity at Barings. And this is Streaming Income, a podcast from Bearings. I'm your host, Greg Campion. Coming up on the show, the outlook for U.S. real estate equity and why the real estate equity portfolios of tomorrow might look substantially different from those of today. All right, Joe Gorin, welcome to Streaming Income. It's great to be here. I'm psyched to have you. Uh, It's psyched to talk about commercial real estate. It's a segment of the market that is just really in focus at the moment. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody wants to talk about it. Clearly, quite a few headwinds. You've got structural headwinds. You've got cyclical headwinds. I don't think we're breaking any news uh, by, by talking about that. But what I'd like to get a sense from you, maybe right up front, is are things as dire as the average media headline would lead you to believe today? Well, if folks are uh, going to listen into this podcast and think that I'm going to go glass half full, yeah, uh, I think we all have to be pretty sober about the environment for real estate investing right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Some of the headlines are right, some are overblown, but you know, you really, as you said, cyclical and structural. You really have to dig into those two questions. The biggest cyclical issue we have in real estate right now, which I could argue is a structural issue down the road, is interest rates. Mm-hmm. Real estate is a highly uh, interest rate sensitive asset class. And we've got, in my investing career, one of the most challenging interest rate moves, you know, over uh, of many cycles. And so, you know, what that means is there's a massive value question. Mm. What is equity worth today? No one pro forma the 10 year going from two and a half to three and a half to five percent. Right. That wasn't in anybody's playbook. Yep. So now we're trying to manage the valuation question. There's not all negative out there. There's there's the structural issues. Some are negative, some are positive. Let's hit the first negative one. Okay. Office. Of course. That's a structural issue. Mm-hmm. This is I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, but that's something that we're gonna have to navigate because we're not gonna ever go back to the way people used to use office. You know, as an example, our office utilization number is 60% of what it was pre-pandemic. Hmm. By now, people thought we'd be getting back into the office. We're probably never going to use office buildings the way we used to. That's a major structural issue that we're going to have to work with. And we've got the interest rate problem 
for the value. So other structural issues that we have that are positive, mm -hmm. look at the residential sector. You've got some great tailwinds for apartments and rental real estate. The bad news is home affordability is so difficult today, but those structural issues are having a positive impact on what we can invest in from a real estate perspective. Yeah, okay. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, I also want to give a little context to people, a little historical context. If you think about how real estate equity portfolios have traditionally been constructed, uh, what I'd like to do is understand where we've kind of been where we're at now, and then kind of where we're going, right? Mm -hmm. Because a number of the trends that you mentioned, especially the structural trends, I would imagine are going to change the way institutional investors and others want to actually construct their real estate equity allocations over time. So I think it'd be great to walk through that and leave people actually at the end of this conversation with some real ideas there in terms of you know where they may want to go with their real estate equity allocations but maybe to start where are we coming from what does that traditional mix look like if you uh, you know you mentioned some of the sectors what does that traditional mix look like in your traditional real estate equity portfolio yeah well let's go back to you know the early 2000s I mean even before that you know if you look at the construct of institutional ownership in real estate it was pretty basic for a long time 80s 90s 2000s if you look at the NACREV index, which is basically the major index that tracks institutional ownership in real estate, it was kind of broken up across the categories of office, resi, retail, and industrial. Office was by far the highest holding of institutional investors. Mm. And surprisingly, it was the highest holding basically up until the start of the pandemic. Then you look at the other categories, apartments and retail were a little bit lower in the range of 15 to 20%. So if office was 35 to 40%, then you've got the lowest, which people today are probably going to be surprised to hear. For a very long time, 20 plus years, industrial was the lowest holding. Today, you've had a flip. And it didn't start today. It started really back in 2015, 2017. I would argue that a lot of the shift in institutional ownership in real estate has been driven by technology, innovation, convergences of technology. And that's really sprouted Obviously, the industrial category, it's hurt the, hurt the retail category. Mm -hmm. When you look at the makeup of institutional ownership today, you've got office, which is trending down below, it's right around 25%. It was as high as 35 to 40%. And now you've got apartments that's moving into the 30 plus category. You've got industrial that's very close to the apartment ownership. And retail's a bit of a laggard, but that's been pretty steady. So today is a, a very different outcome in terms of institutional ownership. But a lot of people may think today has been going on for a long time. Mm. It hasn't. Mm. And it's really interesting to see this shift. And I would argue that this is going to be a shift that goes forward. We don't think office is coming back mm -hmm. the way it, it used to in, within institutional ownership. But it's a, it's a much different paradigm. On top of that, You've also had a number of subcategories within each of these four categories that have gotten really interesting. You've got data centers, obviously, with you know increase in, in data storage. Mm -hmm. um, that's a new sector that you could kind of put in that kind of industrial category. You've got life sciences that's exploded in the 2015-2017 category. That's a whole new category of office. You've got student housing and senior housing that have always been there. But you've also got so much transparency and information mm -hmm. that institutional investors and managers are now comfortable going into those categories and they're working their way into the index as well as a component of some of these larger uh, product sectors. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure there's just so much nuance in terms of every single one of those sectors. So um, l let's talk about that because I'd like to understand the risks in some of these and uh, and probably some of the opportunities as well. So let's talk about the office sector first. You know, this sector has obviously been in the headlines more than any other. We've talked about it ourselves quite a bit in podcasts and papers everywhere else. Everybody's got a view. Um, obviously, hit hard by the double whammy of hybrid work, as you were referencing, and, and higher rates. So dramatically, dramatically changed landscape. You already mentioned that it's fallen quite substantially in terms of allocations in institutional portfolios. I'm curious kind of where this goes. I guess I have kind of a double-barreled question for you here. One is, is office still core? Is it a still still a core allocation for real estate equity investors? Question one. And then question two, you mentioned life sciences, but where in this space are there still attractive opportunities if there are? Yeah. Quick answer, no. <laughs> Office is not core today. Mm. Simply because of this structural shift, I don't think there's any core investor out there that's really excited about buying Office. You've got kind of that double whammy of, you know, 
the highest interest rates you're going to pay for real estate today are going to be to fund office. Hmm. And that would even be in the stabilized income category all the way to the more opportunistic redevelopment and development category. I'll be a little provocative and I'll say that office probably shouldn't have been as much of an allocation within the core category over the past 20 years. I grew up at Equity Office many, many eons ago, and we understood how lumpy the cash flows of office are. There's certainly a subset of office that should have always been in the core, but we're talking the highest quality assets with the longest lease terms. And what happened over time is there was such an affinity for office within institutional real estate is I think people overvalued the outcomes. You know, they underwrote renewal probabilities of tenants that were probably too high in multi-tenant buildings. They bought weighted average lease terms that were too short. And if you have that vacancy within an office building, uh, the capital expenditures can really hurt your bottom line. And, and if you're a core investor looking at stability of cash flows, having a multi-tenant office building that doesn't fit that profile is the wrong decision. Mm. And I think a lot of people have paid that price over a number of years. There is the subset, obviously, the best of the best. I will say today, we're not scared of office. We're not scared of a very small subset of office, because I think that's one of the more interesting value-add to opportunistic opportunities out there, because, and a lot of people talk about the have and the have-nots coming out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There's certain assets that will outperform. There'll be certain assets that underperform. We're starting to see the data that's proving this out. But I will say from a capital markets perspective, the babies are getting thrown out with the bathwater. Hmm. And so there are opportunities to go out there and find the haves that are absolutely mispriced. And I'll give you some of the have data that, that really stands behind this. If you take a building that was built from 2015 or more recently, the net absorption of those buildings since the start of the pandemic is about 120 million square feet nationally. That's positive net absorption. If I cobbled together all of the buildings that are older than 2015, the net absorption numbers are negative 350 million square feet. Hmm. And that's a drastic difference. If I look at rents, rents for the better quality 2015 and beyond, call it class A to trophy, rent growth is about 13 to 15% since the pandemic. People are going to be really surprised when they hear that rents are actually up hmm. in that category. They're down about 5%. In the category of you know the the B's and the C's and the lower even the lower quality A's, one of the challenges we have even at the highest level is cost, right? Capital costs are really expensive. Tenant improvements are, are through the roof. So your net effective rents, when I say face rates are up thirteen to fifteen percent, your net effectives are a little bit lower yeah, in terms yeah. of what you're bringing home. But if I can buy one of those assets that's post two thousand fifteen, that's in the right location, it's the right amenities in the HR department looks at that office building and says, that's where I'm going to recruit and retain great talent. Because mm. in the U.S., we're in a fight for the, the the skilled workforce that sits within the office buildings. If they're going to say that, and I can buy that building, as I said, baby out with the bathwater, I can buy that building at cap rates that I haven't seen in my lifetime because of interest rates are high, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to buy that building. Yeah. You know, I worked for Sam Zell many years ago, God rest his soul. Um, and it was all about, you know, the fundamentals, discount to replacement cost. Today, you can actually buy on fundamentals. Hmm. Believe it or not, people are going to be shocked to hear hmm. me say you can buy on fundamentals. Yeah. For those buildings, I think those fundamentals are going to prove out. I'm curious like, if this is actually happening on the ground, if you're seeing transactions come across your desk today that you're ready to pull the trigger on, or is it more you know, a type of thing of waiting for valuations to come to you? Yeah, so we have had deals come across uh, the transom that we like, few and far between. Mm -hmm. When you have a skill team that you know are experts in their product sector, uh, it makes it a lot easier to be efficient. So we throw out you know ninety nine point nine percent of the opportunities that come across. We actually call me crazy. We bought an office building not too long ago during the summer in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, it was owned by a public REIT, and you know now's the opportunity to help fix problems. If there's a seller who needs money by a certain date and they need to transact and they need a credible buyer on the other side who could basically go all cash because leverage isn't giving you, you know, the the bang for your buck that you sure, used to get. Sure, um, you know, there can be really interesting opportunities. These guys uh, called us up. We we like to do off market deals with friends too. Mm -hmm. They called us up. Big public REIT deal was outside of Boston, right at you know the the last stop on the green line for the MBTA. So you got a direct shot into Boston. It's at the nexus of two major highways, 128 and and the Mass Pike. Mm -hmm. We bought it. Financial metrics are 68 percent leased. At a seven and a half cap rate, if we can lease it back up to, you know, call it the high 80s to low 90s. And this project has basically never had any vacancy in it. 
we're close to a 10.5% to an 11% return on cost, which is a very attractive yield for us. It's one of those assets that are timeless. The HR department likes it. It's got higher floor-to-ceiling heights, a lot of light and air, great access to decision-maker housing. And so we bought it. Mm-hmm. And we offered on an all-cash basis, and we promised that we would close by a certain date. And we ended up actually financing that asset on our base case underwriting. So yeah, we, we're yeah. really happy. And I'll just add, the the seller's total basis in the asset was, call it $255 million, and we paid $117. Hmm. Um, so those are the types of deals we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll pursue. Yeah, yeah, wow. Okay, so very much opportunistic in terms of you know the 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 types of deals that are coming across your desk. Uh, seeing not a ton of attractive things, but when they do, but there are kind of diamonds in the rough, I guess, yep. so to speak. Yep. Um, and, and, and by the way, when yeah. you say opportunistic, I yeah. will I will add what you can do today in office mm. is you can generate value add to opportunistic returns by buying core to core plus profiles. And so that is really unique and that window may not be open for too long. Mm. Okay. Okay. Well, that's encouraging to hear. I mean, we started this conversation talking about just all of the very negative dire headlines out there and I think you very realistically painted a picture of there is a lot of bad stuff going on out there. There, there are a lot of challenges, but it's encouraging to hear that the team is still able to find attractive assets like this one and that tick a lot of the boxes. I mean, you mentioned the location of that. I mean, that first thing I think about is that is a lot of technology talent right in that area, a lot of biotech talent in that area. So that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Well, you know, the segment of the market that is perhaps most closely related to office or maybe has become more closely related since the pandemic is residential, right? And so, You talked a little bit about how worker behavior has changed, how the way offices are being utilized has changed. That's having sort of knock-on impacts in the residential space as well, right? If you are, you know, working in an office now two or three days a week, you very likely need some kind of a workspace at home. Maybe you don't have that, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about um, residential. Um, The other, obviously, big factor that's going on, you kind of mentioned up front, is, you know, we've got massive pressure from rates on this sector. It's kind of frozen portions of the market. And you've got a shortage of housing. It's no you know, secret there. We've got basically a, a housing crisis, uh, some could say, in the U.S. So how are you thinking about that from an investment standpoint? And it would be interesting to hear both the kind of structural and kind of cyclical side of you know where you see residential today. Yeah, I would say of all the product categories we're talking about, the strongest tailwinds are behind residential. That's positive from an investor standpoint. If you're buying into rental real estate, you know, I, I do sympathize with the fact that there's a real housing affordability issue. Mm-hmm. We had an issue before, now we got a real issue with interest rates. Up to 2021, the average mortgage for someone looking for a $400,000 mortgage was about 3%. Mm-hmm. Uh, today, that Mortgage is about eight percent. Yeah, it's amazing, and that has basically taken twenty-eight million households out of the the realm of home ownership. Mm-hmm. That's a major tailwind, obviously, for demand generation within rental real estate. But we are obviously bullish on residential. We like, you know, basically all categories of it. Aside from, and I will say, there have been challenges in the urban high-rise category. You've seen a lot of development. You know, one of the challenges is that because residential has become such a sought after product sector, you know, you had very low cap rates driving investments over the past three to five years. And I would say that, you know, people probably overpaid for some of that residential. What it also did is it, it spurred new development. Mm-hmm. Most of that urban development has been in the urban core. We tend to like more suburban residential where, you know, you've got more amenities closer to grade schools. Mm-hmm. Stronger worker nodes outside of the urban core, um, and more space. And so, what you've actually seen since 2017 is the value of suburban real estate is up about 59 percent. When you look at the urban core and you look at the high rise category of residential, comparatively, that's up three percent. Hmm. So, there's a drastic shift in the valuation, and it just shows you the long term fundamentals of yeah, people are moving to cities. Um, there are new interesting areas, but as a, you know, taking a broad brush across the residential sector, you know, we've, we've seen over many, many years, if not decades, that suburban real estate tends to outperform. Hmm. We also want to be careful again with the cap rate environment for residential. So I would say right now, 
similar to office, we're scared about some of the structural challenges in residential. You know, not all managers and owners of residential, I think, have woken up to what the real valuation is. And you're still seeing some of those trades that are in the high 4% cap rate range to low 5% cap rate range, primarily from longer term holders, more private buyers. You're not seeing as much of the institutional Mm -hmm. owner in residential. So we are kind of patient right now. We believe in these tailwinds. We think there's going to be a great buying opportunity over the next, call it, you know, 12, 18, 24 months, but we're going to wait for it Mm. because some of these cap rates have to back up. When you're looking at residential, you have some of the same financing issues you have for office. Not nearly as dire, but the average interest rate you're going to pay when you buy residential is, call it, you know, seven to eight percent. And if you're talking about cap rates over the past few years that range between, you know, three and a half and four and a half percent, well, that dog doesn't hunt Mm -hmm, right now. mm -hmm. And so you could argue that you need cap rates that are in excess of a six handle. Mm And that's even for more of the core core plus. Then we get into more development opportunistic residential investing, and you're talking about sevens. And you know the, the market's just not there yet. It's coming. It's going to go there. We we strongly believe, but it's not there yet. Okay. Now you mentioned that you're more bullish on the kind of rental market, and so tell me about that. I I saw recently Bearings announced a transaction that uh, the mm-hmm. team did in North Carolina, a build-to-rent transaction. Uh, so kind of similar to what we were talking about in office, it's good to see transactions happening. But tell me what you saw there that was so attractive to you. Yeah, and, and what we're drawn to in residential is really you know that, that kind of shift right now if you've got you know, more space. Mm. Um, and so we gravitate towards, you know, we like single family rental where people are actually renting single family mm-hmm. homes mm-hmm. and BTR, build to rent. Mm-hmm. So building some of these, you know, single family homes in master planned areas or even, even a scattered site. And we found an opportunity recently outside of Raleigh. So when we're buying single family rental or, or we're developing BTR, you know, typically we want to find those homes that are within a 20 to 30 minute drive of a major urban center or a major employment node. And we want to find the right, you know, size houses for the users. But, you know, a lot of these young families, the millennials are now finally, you know, they're getting married, they're having kids later in life and they're moving out of those, you know, smaller units and they're looking for, you know, for houses. But again, they can't afford the down payment. They can't afford the mortgage. So this deal was outside of Raleigh. It's about a 20 to 30 minute drive into the urban center. We're buying it from a developer. They're delivering portions of the units over time. It's about 150 houses. Mm -hmm. There's a clubhouse, a pool, so there's great amenities. And that's a deal where we looked at it on an untrended basis, on on a cap rate basis, and it was about a six cap when we originally looked at it. And one of our number one metrics in all multifamily, and this should be everybody's number one metric Mm -hmm. when you're investing in multifamily, is what is the rent divided by the median income level? Because when we buy something, we don't want to upcharge people, right? I'm sympathetic to the affordability issue. We want to be at the right rent level, but we also want to be able to see our way to higher rents. We want growth. As an investor, that's what our clients expect from us. So when we originally looked at this deal, the rent to median income level was in the 35 to 40 percent range, which is a little bit high. We typically want to be under 30 percent mm-hmm. um, in any type of multifamily we do. But as we dug into it, we had our eyes on the future, not the past, and we started to see a real demographic shift in Raleigh and the skilled workers who were moving in with higher median incomes. By the time we closed on the deal, we realized that the real rent to median income level of those people who are now moving into this area of Raleigh was below 25 percent, mm. which is a good rent level. It's an appropriate rent level. It also provides us the opportunity to mark rents up over time at the right level that people can afford. And so everybody wins. So this was uh, one of our entry points into BTR, and we'll continue to do that. Not just in Raleigh, we're looking all over the country because there's so many micro markets like this. Mm -hmm. And we look at SFR. Yeah, that's awesome. I'd love to hear that. And uh, yeah, Raleigh is definitely a more of a booming market these days. Uh, you've obviously got all the universities in the area, a ton of academic uh, institutions, science, technology, so much talent. But that's really cool to hear just how you guys are analyzing that from the bottom up and that that denominator of that that income going up. I mean, that what a what a tailwind that is um, for an asset like that. Over time, yeah, and we also find some of these deals off market from home builders who you know they need the money. 
Mm. Right. And so they'll, if they find a credible buyer who they can do multiple deals with, they, they come to us and, you know, we don't want to be one and done. Yeah. So yeah. we're building, you know, lots of relationships with, with home builders around the country so that we can execute on this strategy. Yeah. I mean, that build to rent uh, segment of the market, that seems like it's going to be in demand for some time to come, just given the, the housing crisis that we mentioned. It seems like there's going to be no shortage of demand there. Okay, well, let's switch gears. I, I know we're sort of bouncing from one sector to another, but I think it's interesting to hear your views on these and even some of these anecdotes, I think, help people understand kind of what's going on on the ground, which I think is hugely valuable. So we mentioned retail and industrial uh, up front. Obviously, these two segments have become much more closely intertwined, I would say, over the last 10 to 15 years, given the rise of Amazon, online shopping, everything that's meant in terms of bricks and mortar effects and uh, you know the rise in demand for well-located warehouses and all that sort of stuff. So let's talk a little bit about that. Those trends, I would say, have been big structural trends for what, a decade plus now? So what I'd be interested in is where does this all go next? Well, I'll break them up and there's some inverse uh, relationship here, obviously. Mm. You know, industrial has cannibalized the footprint of, of retail. They both have their cyclical and structural issues. I would say that, you know, the benefit for retail, and I think this is going to be the long-term benefit for retail, is that since, and, and you said, you know, a decade, it actually is really closer to 2015, 2016, when we saw this cannibalization, this increase with mm. e-commerce mm -hmm. and this shift that was only accelerated, obviously, during the pandemic. But retail really is benefiting from a lack of new supply, you know, and, and I would actually give retail kind of, you know, using my basketball analogy, you know, the sixth man award. It's just chugging along <laughs> and it's doing its job. Yeah. And it still has some stigma attached to it because malls are still in the retail category. Well, you know what? Don't don't buy the regional malls. They're obsolete. You can find open air centers, that's interesting. You know, but when you look at retail in general, you've got, you know, you got most of retail's performing pretty well. The overall vacancy rate nationally across the entire retail sector is just around 4%. That's not so bad. And when you start to look at grocery anchored and strip centers, you're talking about, you know, anywhere between two and a half to three percent. Vacancy, which in real estate we almost call structural obsolescence, mm -hmm, like you can't mm -hmm. get better than that. Right. But you know, there's still some issues with you know the more the retail that caters more to the discretionary consumer, where you can buy those products online. We like to be you know those uh, you know the nail salons, the pizza joints, and and uh, and the grocery stores mm -hmm. where you know it's a must have. You got to go there to get it. Yep. You know there is some cannibalization there, but if you find it in the right location. You know, even with omni-channel now, people want to go into the store, they want to see the product. And so, you know, we like retail. I think we'll be doing more of it. Again, there's still a valuation issue across all product types. So I'm waiting for cap rates to come up, even for retail. Mm -hmm. um, but you're getting a little bit more premium, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. for the strong fundamentals just because of the stigma that's still attached to retail. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. How about on the industrial side? Um, you know, obviously big tailwinds there from the likes of Amazon. What's what's looking really interesting there in the years to come? Yes, yeah, so the inversion with retail is we've got the opposite problem of supply. Mm. And so everybody loves industrial right now. We're a little bit cautious. We're going to continue to do industrial. Right now, as of today, there's 520 million square feet being built in the mm. United States of America in industrial. Wow. So there are going to be pockets that are that are overbuilt. You know, there are plenty of Areas where there's still opportunity, the tailwinds are so strong, right? You've got supply chain reshoring, you've got onshoring, you have a great need for more industrial space, but you're going to find pockets because you've had so much delivered. Just over the past three years since the start of the pandemic, you've had about 8% added to the inventory of industrial across okay. the U.S. Mm. As an example, for retail over the past three years, the same three year period, you've had about 1% added for okay. retail. Yeah. And so I look at the 520 million, I say, we got to be really careful about where we're going to invest in, in industrial. We got to pick the right places. There's still an opportunity to do it. And then I'll also go back to the valuation question that is going to, you know, encompass everything I'm saying, which is cap rates for most of this stuff is still too tight. Mm -hmm. And it means mm -hmm. managers, you know, we all have to get real. And tell our investors what is the right cap rate to mark this asset at. You know, mm -hmm. it, what's been great about industrial over the past five, seven years has been these mark to markets. You know, everyone thought that, well, you know, I'll have three to five percent rent growth, and some buildings get twenty to forty to fifty percent rent growth, if not greater. 
And then what that did is now people go into the sector and they say, oh, great, you know, I can buy at a razor thin cap rate because I'm just going to bet on that mark to market. And they keep betting on that mark to market, but they're pushing out that lease expiration. So I'll buy the three cap knowing that in year five or six, that three cap is going to go to a six cap. Well, what happens if there's oversupply and maybe you don't? So you need to buy at the right cap rate based on your vision for, you know, when does the rollover happen? And too many folks, I think, got lulled into buying at tighter cap rates based on the mark to market argument that may not be there. Okay. So that's a challenge for just valuation purposes. Mm -hmm. We just have to be able to buy at the right cap rate. Financing, it's an easier time to finance residential and industrial right now, but it's still a lot more expensive. And so we'll be focused on the ports. We'll be focused, you know, areas will be focused on some of the port areas that are growing faster than others. There's a whole inland port system that's growing within the United States because the ports are tapped out. Mm. So I think there's a great opportunity to invest around these new emerging inland ports that are going to need more industrial. And looking across the border, you know, onshoring just over the border of Mexico into into Texas and and some of the Southwest states, I think are going to be really interesting opportunities for expanding your industrial footprint. But some areas, you got to not just understand what's in the ground now, but what's being planned. Mm-hmm. So you just have to be smart about you know what you're buying and where. Yeah, yeah. Those supply demand dynamics are really fascinating. Really interesting to hear how it's so different from industrial to retail, especially. You know, when you think about supply, obviously a big part of that is new development, right? So you've kind of mentioned a few things about development. Uh, we we talked a little bit about the build to rent transaction in North Carolina, but you know, a lot of what you hear uh, today about new development is that things are really challenged, right? And it's no surprise, cost of money has got much more expensive. So you know, the economics in many cases may not make sense to um, develop new properties. It, when you look at development, I know this is kind of a broad question, but what actually does work in development today? Ha, huh. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it, few and far between. I, I would say that you know, again, I, I go back to the whole valuation question, and you know, where's the where's the debt? Mm. You're going to finance any development unless you're going to do it all cash. Not a lot of people want to go all cash on development today. You know, you're looking at a SOFA rate, which is kind of the base index rate, you know, replaced LIBOR that we're all utilizing primarily as a base rate. And SOFA's, you know, well over 5% now. And to develop, um, the banks are concerned. And so they're putting spreads on top of SOFA. You know, depending on if it's office, they're going to probably put a thousand points over, you know, basis points over SOFA. Uh, you know, if it's residential or industrial, you could be looking at you know anywhere from 350 basis points to 400 to 500 basis points over. Mm-hmm. And so, there's no available loan for development today that's going to be low of a constant of let's call it eight to ten percent. Um, and so then you have to look at what do you think the rents are going to be if I develop this building to get me outside of negative leverage. And there's very few areas where you can get that. Mm-hmm. I will say there are some distressed land deals. For industrial, where we can come in and buy land at cents in the dollar, and we can start to look at you know the importance of the location and start to make sense, and we don't have to develop it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So that's an opportunity. Residential, I would say we'd prefer not to do ground up. We can find development in residential that's probably in the seventh inning, seventy percent done. Mm-hmm. Well, seventh inning, then my, my fractions are off <laughs> on, a, on a baseball game. Close enough. Close enough. You know, but we don't have to take the full ground up risk. Yep. If we're touching. Office development and people say I'm crazy, but we have had some interesting opportunities where, you know, if you can build something unique in a location that doesn't exist and you can bring pre leasing to the table and you can get to that nine to 11 percent cap rate. Um, and let's say you're 50 to 60 percent leased with a credible, you know, high credit, well known tenant that's going to really brand the asset. Um, I think that could be an opportunity. Uh, down the road, we have entertained a few of those. Yeah, it, I was going to ask you: Has anything come across your desk recently that kind of ticks those boxes? There, there's one deal in particular. Um, I'm not going to tell you the market it's in. It's a very interesting node that is surrounded by residential, cool restaurants. There's an emerging tech element of the mm-hmm, market. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a great demographic shift from other markets. This is a, a more affordable area, mm-hmm. um, maybe a, a more favorable tax environment, both for companies and employees. 
Uh, and it's you know you're, you're it's, narrowing it's, it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Ask me about the weather, and I might give it away. <laughs> but uh, that's a deal that you know we're trying to a land. Call it a fifty to sixty percent pre lease with you know a tenant who could be a game changer for the market. Mm, and that's an, off, an office property. It's an office property, and there's a, you know a couple term sheets from lenders on it. So mm-hmm. there you know there is a lending world that would entertain a term sheet. Hmm. Uh, for a deal like that. And when you look at what can be developed that is so unique, again, you know, the haves, if you can create either repositioning, redeveloping something that's existing into the best building in its competitive set, or you can build it better than anything that's around it. So I always look at the competitive set and everything we do, you know, we're not going to shy away from those opportunities. And we may look back, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now and say, wow, that was, that was the opportunity of a lifetime. Mm, yeah, for sure. All right. I feel like we've kind of been talking about risks this whole conversation, but I do still want to ask you about risks. Uh, no, there's none. If there's uh, if there's anything else out there, I mean, gosh, we've we've talked about rates, we've talked about some of the structures. Wars, recessions. What, what, what do you want? Yeah, I mean, there's no shortage. But is there anything else if you're looking at a real estate equity allocation over the next whatever time frame you want to look at? Let's say five years. Is there anything? That jumps out to you as a as a risk that we haven't talked about yet 